Okay, today we're going to uh, talk about uh, magnetism and we're going to talk about some basics that most people know um, and then get into more and more detail. Um, and today we're just uh, really starting uh, to delve into magnetism. Um, there's a lot of complexities in it, um, but it is pretty cool. All right, so first we're going to talk about poles, um, our first word we have here. And I tried to highlight all the words, uh, all the terms um, in kind of a teal color here. Um, those are the two ends where uh, the effect is the greatest of a magnet. Um, there's no such thing as a monopole, which is it's kind of a cool concept, this alone, that if you have a magnet and you have a north and a south end of a magnet and you were to cut that magnet in half, you do not have just a north end and a south end. You will have made two mini magnets that each have a north and a south end like that. So, uh, yep, no monopole. So there's always two ends. Um, and later we'll get to see um, the reason for that, um, but I don't think we'll hit that today. Um, the end that points to geographic north is labeled north. So we have defined which way, so if you have any um, magnet uh, and you let it freely move, the end that points towards the North Pole or generally to the North Pole, which we'll talk about, um, we that is denoted as being north, all right? And we'll get later into what really geographic north and, and magnetic north is. All right, uh, forces. Well, um, like ends repel and opposite ends attract. Um, this is just like what we've seen in the past with electric charges. Okay, so we have some idea about that. Um, this is our third time that we have seen what I call unseen forces. So we first started with gravity, um, forces uh, that don't have to touch um, to uh, be able to uh, have an effect on each other. Um, and then again, we saw electricity, and now we are going to see magnetism. Um, and we're going to find out that these two are very closely uh, linked with each other. Uh, okay, uh, another term that some people know, uh, ferromagnetic. Um, this term means any material that shows magnetic effects. Um, and let's see if you know any of these. So what materials are ferromagnetic? Well, you can see where this word comes from. The word ferro or ferrous is Latin for iron. And so this definitely includes iron. Uh, if you happen to know what coin, at least an old version of the coin that used to uh, be magnetic, and that is the nickel. Um, and that was because of the high nickel content. Um, you can still get nickels that are magnetic. Um, I think some Canadian nickels are uh, magnetic because of the higher nickel content. If the content is uh, too low of a percentage, then um, you it loses that ability. All right, other ones, cobalt and everyone's favorite, gadolinium. All right, and not only uh, these, but also um, some oxides and alloys um, of these um, will allow it to be ferromagnetic. All right, let's talk about magnetic field. Now, we have had, uh, whoops, sorry, in the past, uh, we've talked about electric field, and it is um, very, very much the same that uh, we can have this in our mind. Let me just try to, can I make, no, it's not going to be happy. All right, so magnetic field, a conceptual area around a magnet where it can apply a force uh, to other magnets. Uh, the direction of the force, if we're going to draw lines just like we drew electric field lines, um, it is going to be directed, make sure they're arrows and not just lines, um, it's away from north, right? And the force is always going to be tangent to the field lines that you happen to draw, okay? The strength of field, just like with electric field, uh, can be seen by the number of lines uh, per area. So in other words, the density of the lines that we see. 
um, will allow you to do that. All right. So what do we have now? Oh, our symbol is B. And uh, again, odd, odd choice. Um, I can't quite remember the reason that we have uh, B as our symbol. Okay. Now we're going to draw some lines here. Let's see what we can do here. Uh, so we have to have lines that move away from north. Here, how about I switch color just to make things a little interesting. Oh, no, come on. Sorry. All right. So away from north and towards the south. Well, there's our easy ones. Um, and these lines are continuous loops. So, um, and let me draw, so I'm going to draw one here and I'm going to try to be uniform because it's going to, these should be the same strength. So, and then include your arrows. So away from north and then a big, all right. And in this case, it's going to be symmetrical and I'm going to go over my words because I didn't leave enough space. All right. So kind of imagine this kind of thing. And uh, I'm going to draw some little lines through here because there is a field inside. And so that's where it's unlike the electric field because the lines uh, connect. All right. Okay. Or I can say they, here, let me switch colors again to my, okay. The lines connect and are loops. Okay, they are continuous loops, and we don't have to, we don't see that in electric field. They just connect, you know, um, one to there, or the the way a positive charge would move, and that would not be in a loop. All right, we also know a compass at any point, right, will point the direction of the field. All right. All right. Let's talk about that field. All right. So the Earth has um, a magnetic field, and we see lots and lots of times pictures of this. Um, and it is a complicated issue, but it is thought to be produced by, do we know? All right. I'm sure a lot of people have heard of this before, but the molten iron outer core all right, and being iron uh, makes the Earth have a magnetic field. Okay, now look how I put this in quotes. The North Magnetic Pole is in the Canadian Arctic. Um, it's about a thousand kilometers away from geographic north, which creates problems with a compass because our compass is going to point towards uh, magnetic north, even though we're trying to normally, um, if you're scouting around, go, uh, you know, the maps and everything are pointed towards uh, geographic north. And because of the difference in those two, uh, we have something that's called declination. So declination here is the difference between the way a compass needle points and ge where geographic or true north would be pointing. And we can see this map of the U.S. where um, there's one place if you follow, okay, oops, it's all golden, right? Along here, both line up exactly. Um, but in other areas, it's, it's not going to work out for you. Um, the direction, you can see if you're out in California, there's going to be a big difference um, between uh, the direction of true north and geographic north. And so that's why if you have a compass, okay, a true scouting compass, uh, there is the way the needle points, and then you have a bezel that you can rotate the amount of degrees difference between um, those points. Um, I can't remember exactly what in Michigan, I thought it was like 17 degrees, but I, I'm, I'm not exactly sure anymore. Um, but every topographic map will uh, tell you the declination angle in, in, on the bottom, and then you can set your compass accordingly so you can uh, make sure you navigate properly. 
The other thing that can happen is a uh, dip. And that is uh, when you have, look, look at this map right here. We can see uh, the field lines, uh, the magnetic field lines. And if you have a compass and you're right at the equator, we can see here your compass would be parallel to the earth or parallel to the horizon. But because that field dips into the earth, um, if you hold a compass at any other latitude, we can see that compared to um, the horizon, right? Oops, sorry. You know, whoops, there, I didn't switch colors. Um, there is a definite angle between the two. So the angle between the horizon, if a compass was flat on that surface that, you know, is curved, uh, then that's this is going to be our angle right there that we're measuring. And if you were exactly at magnetic north, it would dip straight down into the earth. All right. Now here's something really magical. We're going to see how electric current and magnetic uh, field relate. Um, how is electricity and magnetism uh, having an effect on each other? Well, in 1820, um, Hans Christian Ørsted found that when a compass is near a current carrying wire, the needle deflects. All right. So when you have a compass and you put it near a, an active wire, it turns out that the needle starts to move. And so what does that mean? What is the, the, the result of that? That means that current, we know, forces a magnet. Okay, current can force a magnet. All right, so what's the conclusion of that? Well, how do you normally force a magnet? You can have another magnet, right? So it's like the Earth's magnetic field affected a compass because a magnet can affect a magnet. So therefore, our conclusion is that current must be producing a magnetic field. Okay, which I find really, really wild. All right, so let's draw in what that field would look like. Well, it has been discovered that we can have another right-hand rule to be able to remember what this current looks like. All right, and here is the right-hand rule. Um, I put it in a little green right there. Um, and right-hand rule will abbreviate RHR because we keep getting right-hand rules here. Okay, so you grab a wire, so your thumb points in the direction of the current, and your fingers are curved. This um, should remind you of a little bit of the right-hand rule we use for circular motion. And the direction your fingers are curved and encircling the, the so-called wire um, is the direction of the magnetic field produced in that current. And remember, it has a direction. So it isn't just curvy lines. Um, it is, they are arrows. And so um, here on this wire, we would draw in those lines. Um, I'm going to try to draw them a little bit um, 3D so that they are coming from behind the wire over the top of the wire and in. And so... And then imagine a bigger one further out. Okay. All right. So there are going to be circles around that wire. Okay. All right. Imagine those are perfect circles. All right. Now imagine you have a coil of wire. So it isn't just straight anymore. Well, imagine this right here is kind of coming out of the page, right? And so we are going to try to uh, draw that in. And so imagine, right? It's going to, imagine if your fingers, your finger, your thumb would be pointing out here, right? And it would loop, your fingers would loop under this wire and up and around like that, okay? I'm gonna do one more. So imagine it's coming through that loop like that. Okay, I'll put some more arrows. All right, now what if you grab the bottom of the wire? All right, oh, I, I am so sorry. I forgot to label the direction. Whoops, sorry, 
again of current. Sorry, I was assuming the current was going like this. So I'm going to label that I for us right there. Okay, so now let's do this again. So what about down here? In this case, your thumb would have to be pointing back this way. And if your thumb is pointing back, now the current would be looping like this. Okay, coming through here, going around like this. And at some point, they are going to be, all right, coming together. And so here we have our current like this, and I'm going to draw it where they meet should be a straight line coming through like this. All right, so we have a magnetic field, right, circling a wire just like we see here, circling a wire like we see here, and they meet and come together and, in fact, increase in strength as you have both of these um, together, okay? Now, what's interesting is the field strength is uniform within the coil because over here you just have that one and this one is far away, right? So it's not really adding to it as much. And on this side, you just have this one, and this one isn't adding to it as much. In the middle, you kind of have half of one and half of the other for the total field strength. So throughout the coil, it's a kind of an interesting fact that it isn't the most right down the middle. It's, it's even throughout the, throughout the coil. All right. So I'm going to try to demonstrate for real the right-hand rule so you don't just have to see it on a piece of paper and see it a little bit more 3D. Um, I'm going to try. Okay, so this is just another right-hand rule. We're going to see um, a second one uh, for magnetism, uh, and we've already seen one for circular motion, and um, they just keep coming. All right, so this is the right-hand rule. Remember to use the right-hand rule. We get to use our thumb. Our thumb is going to point in the direction. So here's the, the one in, in the notes. Um, we have the current um, going up. And so here is my, a physical rod. Pretend this is a, a current carrying wire with the wire going up. And if I go to grab it with my thumb pointed upwards, my fingers are going to curve in the direction of the field. So you can see if I line this up like this, my fingers would wrap around and the current would go out to the front and into the back like this. Um, and you could actually say, in a sense, that would be spin up. And so again, um, I could end up uh, drawing that field then. So coming out, oh, hang on, markers are not working. Coming out like this and coming back around, okay? And coming out in front and back around like that, okay? All right, now how about when we get a little more um, complex and we are going to do um, a hoop. This is um, my example of our hoop like this. I tried to draw, it's really hard to draw 3D, but imagine the hoop is sticking out like this, all right? And I have the current drawn that the part that's going out, the current is coming down like this. So in this case, right, all right, my hand has to grab it like this. I'm going to come around this side so I can do that more. So my thumb is going to grab like this. So at the top of the hoop here, right, it's the magnetic field is going to loop around underneath and go to the right. Okay, can you imagine that? All right. So again, I could try to draw that in. And I've already lost. There we go. I'm always losing those markers. Okay, so it's going to wrap around, go underneath right, like this, okay, all right, and I could draw another one like this, so underneath that front, right, in, and come through here, okay, now, what about the bottom, so let's look at that again, if I want to do the bottom, right, and I said the current's going like this, right, whoa, whoa. this is rough to do, okay, so it is wrapping around like this, we can see, Look, it's coming down, you know, around, and my fingers are still going this way. Inside, they're still going to the right, okay? So let's try to draw that again so you can see. So it wraps around, comes in like that, right? Oops, it, except for it would be circular. Let me draw a little more circular, okay? 
All right, it's me trying to draw 3D with it. Okay, so again, it's gonna come around in the middle. All right, so that again, in the end, the field, according to both the top and the bottom of this is going to uh, make it go in that direction, okay? Which is a pretty cool effect um, and will lead to some um, interesting things that we're gonna do later. All right, so Ursted just said that electric current can put a force on a magnet. So how about the opposite? So a magnet, it turns out, can exert a force on a current carrying wire. All right, so if one can force the other, the other can force the first. It's almost like Newton's third law right here. All right, so let's see an example here. And we can see there's another picture of a hand, which means we have another right hand rule. This is going to be the third one you're going to learn for physics. It's so exciting. All right, um, here I have drawn in B, which is our magnetic field. Um, remember, it always uh, points away from north and towards south. So and we're only going to do it between right here, the two ends. Um, we don't care about the rest of the field right now because we're just going to focus in on that. Here I have a current carrying wire where I have the eye going kind of away from us like this. And what is going to happen? So uh, this current carrying wire is going to be forced. And which direction is it going to be forced? Well, this right-hand rule, if you take a look at it, um, is going to show you that this is... Um, all three of these things are perpendicular to each other, okay? So your fingers will point in the way the current is going. Your uh, other, so if you imagine that you were able to bend your fingers at a right angle, um, that is the direction of the magnetic field. You can either point with all three of your fingers um, or some people bend actually all four of their fingers. The way they all bend would then point to the magnetic field and the force is perpendicular to both of those, which would be your thumb um, in, this, in this position pointed up. Now, if you were to take a look at this right here, what does that mean? Well, see if you can point your fingers, your, your finger, yeah, your index finger into the page right there. And then your hand has to be aligned in such a way that your middle finger at right angle to your index finger is going to point uh, from north to south, so to the right as this picture shows, which way will your thumb end up pointing? What is that going to be? I'm gonna switch colors again, and I'm gonna draw it in. Did you figure it out? Did you try to align your hand? All right, here is the answer it would end up pointing down. And if it's pointing down, that wire is going to get pulled in that direction. Okay, so it's gonna get pulled down. If we were to reverse this, um, then it would be up. Or how about this? If you were to reverse the current direction, the wire would be uh, pushed up. Okay. All right, so now we're gonna talk about the magnitude of force. And remember magnitude meaning the amount or quantity of the force. Um, and this is going to end up with our first formula for magnetism and believe me, not our last. All right, so uh, let's do some general things that you probably would imagine. If you increase I or the current, you are going to increase the force, all right? If you increase the length, um, and we're really talking about the length of the wire that's exposed to the field. So how much area of field or length of field are you in with a wire? Um, that as well is going to increase the force. And the more perpendicular the current is to the magnetic field. Again, think of the right hand ruled with that. An increase of force is felt. And so we end up with our formula here and uh, we can see it, uh, that force, yay, force is still an F, 
um, equals IL, and we make that a little cursive L, B sine angle. So, uh, right, we realize this should be current, right, which is in amps. Uh, here is, let's, not just a length of wire, this is the length of wire exposed to field. And of course, that's going to be in meters. Here is the strength of the field, which we haven't talked about the unit yet, but just going to come in a second. And then this is the going to be the angle between I and B. All right. Now, what would be the maximum force? The maximum force would be when uh, we are the most perpendicular, which would be 90 degrees. And when you take sine of 90, it becomes 1, and it would go away. So when the angle is 90 degrees, we can simplify the formula just to I times L times B. Okay, how about these units? Notice I label the units of everything here, except for the strength of the field. Um, and it's a wonderful unit named after a pretty cool scientist. And we have the Tesla, all right, with a big capital T. All right, if we want to quantify what a Tesla is, because it is a combined unit, um, a Tesla is one Newton per amp meter. Okay, uh, I guess it used to be a Weber per meter squared, which is pretty cool. Uh, but now we've um, changed everything to um, being... Uh, derived with with amps and because of that um, it looks like this all right if we wanted a CGS unit it is going to be the Gauss um, and that is a capital G and um, if you remember if we have the CGS system so we have centimeter instead of meter and gram instead of meter and the difference between that is always 10,000 and so what we have going on is that one Gauss is going to be 1 times 10 to the minus 4 Teslas. All right, and let's get some uh, relative amounts for this so that you have a feel for what these numbers. The Earth's magnetic field at the surface is 1 half, whoops, sorry, 1 half a Gauss. All right, so if we wanted that in terms of Tesla, pretty small 0.5 times 10 to the minus 4 Tesla. Strong electromagnets around uh, two Tesla. All right, see the big difference there, obviously. Um, and superconducting magnets um, around 10 Tesla. All right, so that's uh, quite a big deal. All right, uh, here's our last uh, part of our lecture today. Uh, if we want to do some diagramming when we have both uh, magnetic field and current. Things get pretty complicated trying to draw these uh, pictures 3D. So there is a way we do it in, in physics, and that is if we want to represent something coming out of the page toward us and we can't manage to draw things 3D, we represent this arrow coming out of the page So you, because these all have directions. So think of it being a real arrow like this kind of arrow, like the arrow shot with a bow and arrow, all right? And, all right, oh, that's, okay. There is an arrow. There's my picture of an arrow. So if you were to view it this way, like your eyeball was going to look at it like this, what would you see? And so some scientists came up with the idea that it would look like this. So there's the tip of the arrow, and this is the whole arrow coming out at you. So when you see a symbol like this, this means an arrow coming out at you. So what about if the arrow is going into the page? What would you see? Well, you would see you're going to spy right the arrow this way. And so they said you would see an X, an X of, and I looked this up, of the fletching which is, you know, where those feathers are in that X shape. And so many times you'll see it represented as an X. 
Now to keep things uniform, sometimes you'll just see X's, but sometimes you'll see them put a circle around the X, which I think ruins the picture because that's not what it looks like here, but whatever. So um, the little dot in a circle is the tip of the arrow coming out of the page and X's are into the page. And as, as long as you, rep, or, you, know, you remember that, all is good there. All right, so here is a interesting little problem. Here we have, let's say, a coil of wire, but not really coil, um, right? I made square to make things a little more understandable. And it is being hung by a spring scale. And it's hung by a spring scale because we can measure then a force on this wire. And this wire, I have included um, that it has a battery so that we can have current. And I'm going to draw current. Um, I didn't even really think about it. But um, our current is going to be in this direction. And so I'm going to keep label this around like this. So we have current looping around like this. And then we have our B, our magnetic field, right? This is going to represent B. And it is coming out towards us. Now, if this is the case, we have to figure out um, the direction of force on each of these sides. So what is really going on here? Well, can we do that last right-hand rule? So we need our fingers uh, pointed down. And if our fingers are pointed down, we have to also be able to make our middle finger bend in the direction of the field which is out. So if you try to do this right now with your piece of paper, you're first put all your fingers down. I think that's the easiest way. Then you're going to point that middle finger out of the page. And if you've done that, you should be able to see your palm right now. Okay? And if you so now which way is your thumb pointed in this case? All right? Do you see it? So index finger pointed down your middle finger pointed out of the page, and your thumb, all right? So if I'm gonna label my forces, I'm gonna switch again to red so I can do this. Which way is your force? Okay, it's gotta be perpendicular to those other two, and this is the direction of the force. Okay, now let's do the same thing on the other side. What's gonna be happening over here? Well, in this case, your index fingers, right, have to be pointed up, all right? And if you do that and you also need to have your middle finger be able to point out of the page and your palm should be up um, and your thumb should be pointed to the right. Okay. All right. So what does this really mean? It means, and do you see that the same amount of length of wire is in the field on each of these sides? Well, if that is the case, what do you think is going to happen with those two forces? We already know. They're equal and opposite, and therefore they would cancel. So those are gone. So the last thing we have to deal with is this bottom part of the wire. Um, and let's do our right-hand rule again. So we're going to have take our hand, and our index finger you have to orient so that it is pointed um, to the right. Your middle finger has to, again, point out, um, out of the page. And which way is your thumb pointed in this case? Well, when I do it, my thumb is pointed down. So what is going to happen is this is going to pull down, and we're going to get a reading on the scale. So we literally could read the force right of that magnetic field right there. Okay. And we measure B, we could measure this length of wire, um, make sure it's perpendicular, and then we could, uh, two things, one, uh, know the amount of current that's there, or if you know the current, you could know the force, or this would be a, a fun little experiment. But these two cancel, and you're just left with this bottom wire with uh, creating a force. All right. Let's do a 3D version of this example now. So here we have this magnetic field, this is the edge of it, um, coming out at us, because these are the arrow tips. So this is all the field coming out at us. 
and we have our wire loop like this um, where we have um, our direction. So this is representing B. Here is our, uh, whoops, let me switch colors again. Um, our current is going to be like this. All right. All right, now let's figure out what the direction of force is. So we're gonna have our fingers, all right, are going to point the direction of the field. And so we, we know they have to be down. And we have to be able to make it, the question is, is it down like this or down like this? And it's gonna be down like this because I need my, my index or my middle finger to be able to bend out. And in some examples, your book has the whole hand bend. But if you want, right, you can just uh, uh, do your index finger, my other finger, my middle finger has to point out of the page, and then my thumb is going to point in the direction of the force. So we can see that my thumb is pointing that way. So my force, which is perpendicular to the field, magnetic field and the current, is like that. Now how about on this side of the wire? This side of the wire, my fingers have to point up. The question is, should my palm be down or palm be up? Well, which way can I make my fingers bend to the direction of the field, perpendicular? So here, index finger up, my uh, middle finger is pointing out of the page to align with the field, and that means my thumb is pointing to the right, which is the direction of the force. So my force would be in this direction. And then I can repeat that process um, and I have to put my fingers this way, but is this gonna work out? Nope. So my hand has to be in this direction so that my middle finger can come out, all right? And now my thumb is pointing down, and so the force is down. And like when we had physics last year, we know that this force would be equal and opposite to this force, they would cancel. So overall, on this loop of wire, the force would be down, and you could read the amount of that force with this Newton spring scale minus the force of gravity. Of course, there would be this and the force of gravity on it. And if you knew how much this loop weighed, you could subtract that and find out what that is. All right, which has to do with this right here. This would be the length of wire that would be within the field. This length of wire and this length of wire can be canceled because of those opposite effects. So we can use our formula that we know. Um, so if we know F equals I L B sine angle, if we made sure this was perpendicular, that goes away. Um, we know, we could know the length of wire. We could know how much current is in our field based on our battery and resistance of wire. And so if you want, you could solve for B knowing F, or if you knew B, we could solve for F and compare it to the experimental. All right, hope that helped.